And this brings me to one of my heroes of, for this evening's talk, the early 14th century philosopher John Buridan, who explored paradoxes of self-reference. If you know Buridan's name, it might be in the context of an unlucky donkey. In this story, which is sometimes used by political cartoonists, as we see here, Buridan's ass was presented with two equally enticing piles of hay, equally far away, with no rational reason to prefer one pile to the other, the unfortunate animal, unable to choose which food supply to eat first, starved to death. <laughs> now, this story doesn't actually appear in Buridan's surviving works, and it's not clear whether he originated the example, or whether perhaps it was invented by one of his opponents as a refutation of Buridan's philosophy. But Buridan deserves to be remembered for much more than cruelty to animals. There are colourful stories of his life, although modern scholars doubt their veracity. As a young man, he was competing with one Pierre Roger for the affections of the wife of a shoemaker. During this affair, he supposedly hit Roger over the head with a shoe, as a result of which Roger developed a phenomenal memory for which he became famous when he later became Pope, Pope Clement VI. <laughs> and according to other stories, Buridan's rather too close friendship with the Queen of France resulted in the kings having him tied up in a sack and thrown into the River Seine. He survived thanks to the help of a former student. Some version of this story led to Buridan's being name-checked by Villon in one of the most famous of French poems. Où est la Rouen, qui commande qui Buridan, fou jeté, on sac, on sen, mais où sont les neiges tong tong? Where are the snows of yesteryear? Buridan's romantic exploits may be mythical, but his scientific achievements were real and equally extraordinary. In mechanics, he developed a theory of impetus, which in some ways anticipated the ideas of Newton 250 years later. And to him has been attributed the creation of the modern theory of money. I can't resist quoting an example from his economic analysis, which shows something of his provocative approach. He borrows the names of Socrates and Plato for his characters, and he posits that Socrates, willingly, and with her consent, allows Plato to commit adultery with his wife in exchange for 10 books. Buridan argues that while all the parties may have suffered moral injury, in terms of the trade, they have gained something they value. They've, they've gained something they value more than they've paid for it. So in terms of modern game theory, this is not a zero-sum game. It's one from which both participants benefit. Buridan's study of self-reference seems to me to be remarkably modern, and I'm going to show you a couple of his examples. First of all, consider the following statement. I say that I, Tony Mann, am the greatest mathematician in the world. Now, let it be clearly understood that I'm not really the greatest mathematician in the world, or even in this room, but is this statement true or false? Well, Buridan argues that it's definitely true, it says that I say I'm the greatest mathematician in the world, and I did just say that. You might think this is a rather silly example, but the stakes are high, as Buridan goes on to show. For the, Psalm 14 begins, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And for Buridan, what the fool hath said is certainly false. So if my sentence from the previous slide is false, then the first sentence of the psalm must equally be false. But that would mean that David, in writing these words, was lying, which is unthinkable. So it's a matter of some importance that my sentence be true, even if a more natural interpretation would cause you to doubt it. Buridan also analysed another rather nice paradox. Consider this proposition. Someone at this moment is thinking about a proposition and is unsure whether it is true or false. Okay, please think about this proposition. Okay. <laughs> is it true or false? You can't be sure it's false, because somebody in Australia might be thinking, for example, about the Riemann hypothesis, an unsolved mathematical problem, so they are, will be unsure whether that's true or false. 
So you can't be sure this is false. But if you're unsure, then the proposition is in fact true. So you've established it, so you aren't unsure. So the proposition must be true. And yet, as far as any of us know, you might be the only person in the world who's thinking about a proposition at the moment, and you're not unsure of it because you've disproved that it's true. So where does that leave us? Well, the reason I've introduced Bourdain was to show that another of his self-referential sophisms anticipated my prediction, um, which my volunteer got wrong. In this example, Socrates wishes to cross a bridge which is guarded by Plato. Plato tells Socrates that if Socrates makes a true statement, Plato will let him cross, but if he makes a false statement, then Plato will throw him in the river. Now, if all Socrates wanted to do was to cross the bridge, he could simply say, I exist, or two plus two equals four. But in fact, Socrates chooses to say, you will throw me in the river. Plato is now nonplussed. If you throw Socrates in the river, then Socrates was telling the truth and should have been allowed to cross. But if he let Socrates cross, then Socrates' statement was a lie, and he should have been thrown in the river. So what this shows is that Plato has made an unwise promise that he cannot keep. 